clients hire lawyers to advocate for the best outcomes possible for their legal stories. And legal arguments exist as the tools that lawyers use to advocate for their clients' endings to their stories. So legal arguments are part of the client's legal stories, and it makes sense that we teach storytelling and storytelling techniques as part of teaching legal arguments. When we teach storytelling techniques, here's where we um, can add the persuasion, the creativity that Professor Tishioni was just talking about in her presentation. Here's where we can make word choices that will help our client reach their outcome to the ending, the ending they want to their legal story. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. And specifically, I'm going to talk about it as it pertains to the rule statement, which is the formulation or the synthesis of all of the authorities in that jurisdiction and how we bring them together and how we bring them together in the context of the client because this is the client's story and we need to teach students much more about the client than we are currently doing in law school. So, when we talk about legal argument, we're really talking about rule-based reasoning, which is simply taking the familiar of legal analysis and connecting it to the unfamiliar of the client's factual situation. If we can have our rule statements feel familiar and connected to the legal story of our client, then when we get to the unfamiliar of our client's story, wait, I just saw that, um, it will just drive towards the outcome our client wants. We're priming. We're priming towards the outcome. How do we do it? With word choice. And remembering that the best way to get things into long-term memory are through mental images or images plus words. We've all heard of dual coding theory. So how do we choose those words? Well, let's know something about how we think. When we get up every morning, we connect our prior experiences to our new experiences. The, here we go again with the familiar and the unfamiliar. If you wake up in a strange hotel, as we all did this morning, we knew to get up and get dressed. Why? Because we connected the familiar to the unfamiliar. When we needed to come to the sixth floor, which is in a new building, how did we get there? Well, we went into our memory banks and looked for, how do I do that? Oh, I go down an elevator, and we began looking for the elevator. We live our lives through memory. Memory is stored as stories, and they're stored visually. We go into the filing cabinet in our mind, which is the visual that I have uh, static up here, and we pull images, or we pull vignettes with images and connect them. So how are these images stored? Four ways, objects, characters, actions, or settings. Those are the four things that you can describe. The words that we choose will call from the filing cabinets of our readers specific images. Depending on the word we use, the more specific that image. Otherwise, they will default to what's called a stock image, their stock image, which sometimes is fine, but sometimes isn't fine. So let me give you an example. Think of, or choose an object, think of a tree. Just a tree. Okay, I gave you no context at all, I, so I just asked for your stock image. Undoubtedly, your tree was outdoors, taller than you, and had green on it. If I had provided different context, said, think of a tree that's about this big and lives indoors, you might have gone to a bonsai tree or something like that. If I had said, please think of a tree that has needles instead of leaves, you would have chosen an image from your files that was an evergreen of some sort. So, words have meanings, words have details. We've all heard the expression, an image is worth a thousand words, which all came from advertising once upon a time in the 1920s. Um, what are we going to do to choose it? And how are we going to get our students to think about it? Well, we automatically do that, although we might not understand that we're doing it. When we say, please don't refer to case precedent parties as plaintiff and defendant, but try and use descriptors. We're asking them to do that because we're saying it's much more memorable to the reader 
if they remember that that case involved the talk show host who slapped a guest, or the stand-up comedian, or the middle school teacher who broke up a fight in the cafeteria, or something like that. It's so much more memorable than the plaintiff in that case, or Mr. Smith. I don't mean uh, Mr. Smith, Jill Smith's husband. Um, so, but we're already doing it, although we might not understand why we're doing it. We can make it more transparent to our students. And we should actually be teaching them to watch for visual words, because those visual words will help them with their legal argument, especially when we get to the rule explanation or illustration. Pull those details from the prior cases that they'll need to make them more creative and the better legal arguments when they're making their analogies. So let me give you an example of how you can walk students through something as simple as a witness saw something very important while she was preparing food. Well, that seems like a reasonable statement. Okay, I have an idea of it. Except you're all defaulting to whatever your stock image is of preparing food. My stock image right now is of MasterChef Junior because that's the show I like to watch. I mean, I don't really prepare food, I order food, so. Um, <laughs> all right, so if you just say somebody cooked food, we don't have a lot of information about how that witness witnessed the very important thing. We don't know the proximity, there's just no context. And it may be very important. But if we say she barbecued food, now we have so much more context. We understand the proximity of the witness to whatever it was she was witnessing. Right, there's probably a backyard involved. Hey, maybe there was a social engagement. We have a season in mind. We certainly know what kind of food is being prepared. And that's a very different situation than if somebody is baking food. Because if they are baking food, they are indoors, they are in a room, and that is an enclosed space, and they're probably in closer proximity to whatever it is that they're witnessing that is important. So by having our students stop in class for just a little while and talking about some important visual image words from case precedents or from the statutes, from the regulations, that will help them as they're crafting their own legal arguments. So now let's move into that rule statement. You have a student who needs to represent a client who needs a narrow reading of a, of a law, of a statute. Unfortunately, either the statute calls for a broad interpretation itself in the legislative declarations, or there is um, a high court that has itself called for a broad interpretation of the statute. So in synthesizing a rule statement, there's no way that the student can use the word narrow, which of course is what the student wants to use, or they want the antonym. They can't do it. There's no credibility to that word if they put it in the rule statement. So what kind of a word are they going to use? Well, if we as teachers reverse engineer this and say, let's start with the image. What's the image of the word you want for that rule statement? Limited is an okay word. It's not very visual, but have them think visually. Draw it, Google it, clip art it, whatever. And maybe they'll come up with a word like boundary, which is a visual word, right? Boundaries, feels like walls or fences. And that makes some sense. A rule that is broad, it doesn't go out to infinity. Somewhere there's a boundary to it. And maybe our client situation is outside the boundaries. So if we call this, if we say, this rule has boundaries, and we then go looking in our rule illustrations for the boundaries, that case was right on the edge. You know, the, the court that said, this is the line, and we're over that line, so we're outside, that's the better way to make the legal argument. But we're not done yet, because we still want to put that in context with the client. Why? because we want that client to be part of the familiar of the rule statement to prime the reader with the client before we get to the analogical reasoning part of it in the application section. 
So we're introducing the client, and then we're going to talk about the client in the unfamiliar. Why should we do that? Because the reader's attention span is greatest up front. The just like the student's attention span is up front, um, they care about it more up front. That, you know, in the middle of your class, you feel the energy kind of dying. That's actually, unfortunately, where the most important part of legal reasoning is in the, uh, the argument section, is in the middle. Um, you don't want to start trying to make the connections there. You want them up front, primed. Introduce the client there. Why? The, it's, this is the client's story. The client has to flow throughout, not just in the heading, but there in the rule statement, even though it's a violation of CRAC, oh my god, <gasps> this is when my students will freak out. The big reveal. Here's the big reveal. Here's the payoff slide. Courts in this jurisdiction have created rational boundaries, there in orange is that rational boundaries word, but here in magenta, in this area of law, to prevent situations like the one before this court today, the client has been evoked. That's a rule statement, but it should also look like a holding statement. It should look like the court's outcome. We just offered them what in storytelling we would call the end. <laughs> Yeah, that because you know why? Because that's what we're getting paid to do, is to help write the end. So in fact, we should teach students to write the end and present it to the court so they can simply cut and paste into their decision. Now doing this and teaching students to do this requires you to teach just an extra step. After you write the application, go back and revise that rule statement so that they match. It's, an, it's very easy, but the payoff is this. This is the moment where legal argument and legal analysis and CRAC, whatever, ceases to be about arrangement, as Professor Ciccioni was just talking about. Now it's lawyering. Now they have to think about the client and their role. And this is role assumption for our students. This is where they get to play the part of lawyer and understand what it means to represent towards an outcome. When we say we want to make students practice ready, which I say means client ready, this is where in a legal writing classroom we can turn the novice into the beginner and push them forward towards their next lawyer in courses. Or if they're an upper level, say, okay, we're pushing you towards becoming an actual lawyer out the door. This, is, this at the sentence level is where we can show them how it works. Teach them well. Thank you.